treasurers, the Association of Government Accountants, and a host of organizations representing federal grant and contract recipients, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the Data Act, what recipients should know. My name is Kenny Pointer, and I'm the Executive Director of NASA Act, and I'll be serving as your host for today's event. We're joined today by approximately 900 and federal, uh, 950 federal award recipients, federal grantor agencies, government accountants and auditors, and other interested parties from approximately 350 different locations across the United States. As many of you know, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, or otherwise known as the Data Act, was signed into law May 9th of 2014. It is Congress's latest effort to enhance transparency of government spending. The Data Act amends the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, or FFATA, which was actually passed in 2006 by disclosing direct federal agency expenditures and linking federal contract loan and grant spending information to various federal programs. The Data Act is also intended to establish government-wide data standards, uh, simplify the reporting for entities that receive federal funds, improve the quality of data, and lastly apply approaches that were developed by the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board during the Recovery Act to spending across the federal government. Under the Data Act, reporting requirements apply to the federal awarding agencies. However, Government-wide financial data standards will be established for all federal funds and be used by both federal agencies and recipients. These data standards include 57 common data elements for financial and payment information, and they were finalized uh, very recently, just in August of 2015. So, so what do these new requirements mean for recipients of federal contracts, loans, and grants? Today, our speakers will clarify the current impact on recipients and explain what recipients can expect in the future by focusing really on two primary areas. First, the requirements for agency reporting and those data standards that I just mentioned. How does the new reporting of federal agency account level data affect recipients of federal awards? Also, how do the final data standards affect recipients of federal funds? Also, we'll cover in the second major item, section, the Section 5 pilot. Of course, this is a provision in the law itself. You know, what's the intent of the pilot? What are the areas of focus in the grant-specific portions of the pilot? What will be expected of pilot participants? What is the time frame for the pilot? Will the pilot participants share data with Health and Human Services, or HHS? And lastly, what is the expected time commitment that a participant in the pilot can, it, can be expected to incur. To answer these questions and more, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us today Karen Lee and Mike Heckham. Karen Lee is the Chief Management Controls and Assistance Branch, Office of Federal Financial Management with the U.S. Office of Management and Budget. Mike is the Director, Data Act Project Management Office, Office of Grants and Acquisition Policy and Accountability with the United States Health and Human Services, or HHS. Now, following, today's, uh, following the presentation by our speakers, we will have approximately 10 minutes for questions and answers. And today, as normal, we're allowing participants to receive audio through either their computer or their phone. And to ask your question live, if you'd like to do that, please use the raise your hand function of our webinar software and simply click on that hand icon that's located in the toolbar. Uh, remember, if you're asking your question using your computer, uh, your computer must have a microphone uh, built in for that process to work properly. Now, if you prefer, and many of you do this, uh, if you prefer to just simply type your question and send it to us at any time during the webinar, you can do that as well uh, by using the questions tab located in the webinar toolbar located on the right-hand side of your screen. Just simply type in your question and send it to us, and then we'll bring those out uh, during the Q&A session in the order uh, in which they are received. Now, our speakers will be using PowerPoint presentation, a PowerPoint presentation today, which you should be able to see on your screen now. And we are, at the moment, posting that PowerPoint presentation uh, to all of the uh, registrants. So you should be able to get that link relatively soon. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties at all, please give us a call. Our number here is 859-276-1147. Again, that number is 859 
276-1147. As you can tell, we have a really full agenda uh, today. I want to express my gratitude to our speakers for taking time from their very busy schedules to be with us today. And with that as a very brief background, let me turn the program now over to our speakers, Karen Lee and Mike Peckham. Karen and Mike, welcome to today's webinar. And Karen, I believe you're going to start us off. Kenny, thank you so much for that extraordinary overview of the Data Act. Um, and thank you and, and to everybody who is joining us today on the webinar for taking the time out of your days um, to focus on something that we hear um, across OMB and HHS, Department of Treasury, and the broader federal community have been focusing on for quite some time in depth. Um, it's just an exceptional opportunity for us to bring our conversations that have been um, oftentimes a little uh, too frequently within the Beltway, more to the rest of the community outside of our normal scope um, and sphere of conversation. Um, and so what we'd like to do today, um, Mike and I, is really give um, a, an overview from a recipient perspective of what the Data Act is um, in two broad brushes. One from the perspective of data standards and the work that we've done this year under the Data Act, and then second, the Section 5 pilot. Um, to kick it off, um, Today, I think we, we want to walk through not only a broad um, data act overview um, and talk about Section 5 pilot and uh, the work there, um, but most importantly then leave you with some next steps um, because um, as we are working on all things related to the grants community, we know that it is you, all of you, our federal grants recipients that give the momentum um, and the force behind all of our policy work. Um, so what we'd like to do is frame up the conversation and make sure that you all have um, the context to understand what those next steps are, um, but then invite really a broader discussion um, of action. So as Kenny framed up, uh, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act was passed last May in 2014 with the very broad goal of increasing transparency in federal spending. Um, from a federal grant recipient perspective, you are both the beneficiaries of additional transparency, um, but also to some extent you may be affected by the reporting additional requirements um, and what some have talked about as the cost of transparency um, in order to bring that um, additional data to the public. What we want to talk about today is there's been a lot of conversation about transparency and its benefits for certain. Um, because of the purpose of this conversation, we really wanted to drill into more the impact of the Data Act on recipients as federal reporting entities um, pursuant to your grants. Um, because there's been just a lot of conversation out there, um, and frankly not um, linear, about how the Data Act affects grantees, um, we really appreciate this opportunity that Kinney um, and others um, across the association the broader grants community have given us to to take some time to clarify. Um, Kenny highlighted that there are really three, three major areas that potentially could affect grant recipients. Um, Government-wide data standards, um, our efforts to simplify reporting, um, and our work to improve the quality of the data. Um, and those are the three vectors um, that we'd like to dig into today. Let me start with uh, the data standards. Um, so to pull back to the original statute of the Data Act and data standards, the Data Act envisions um, in broad strokes that there will be a one-stop website where you can track, any person can track the federal budget as appropriated and see how those dollars are spent um, from the federal agency level all the way um, through the sub-recipient um, to that sub-recipient. Um, it hooks onto what many of you may be familiar with, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act that established in the first instance that award level reporting and adds, in very simplistic terms, adds agency level um, accounting data. That is to say, agency level budgets as appropriated and how the agencies have spent that through the categories of spending um, that are currently accounted for. Um, in addition to that requirement of additional data on a publicly um, facing website, that agency account level data. Um, in addition to that, the Data Act envisions that we establish data standards. And why? Um, because simply that in order to have all of this data be able to be aggregated and disaggregated to be used for transparency purposes, for decision making purposes, cross agency, data standards facilitate that work. If you have disjointed data across agencies um, that cannot be compared, um, you really limit the value and the power of that data. 
Um, and so when the Data Act contemplated that we establish clear and consistent data standards um, by May 2015, um, that was frankly the first major push of our work um, under the Act. Um, as we worked over the past year and a half on data standards, we identified what has now um, come to you know, as those 57 data elements. Um, these 57 data elements include not only data elements um, from a more technical financial management perspective, um, think data elements related to fundamentally federal agencies and how they account for their um, financial data, object class, um, something we call treasury account symbol, as two examples. Um, in addition to those core agency level financial pieces of data, um, we also took the opportunity to tackle some award level data elements, things like place of performance, um, purpose of the award, uh, I'm sorry, place of performance, uh, recipient location. Um, and the effort there was to really dig into the opportunities to further standardize those data elements where we have heard not only from all of you, um, but other stakeholders at the federal level that there are opportunities to improve the quality of that data. Um, in May of 2015, earlier this year, um, we finalized the first 15 data elements um, that were required under statute. Um, these data elements required under statute re resulted in standards for financial data elements. Um, we took the summer to add on to that 15 the remaining data elements um, that speak to the award level data. Frankly, the data that oftentimes you as grant recipients um, would report in part or in full through your post-award reporting requirements or through additional requirements uh, to USA spending um, via the sub-award reporting um, system. One of the biggest questions um, that we have received from the recipient community is, great, you've standardized these 57 data elements. To what extent are any of those data elements, um, do they affect us? Um, and I will answer that in, in two parts. Um, severing the question um, between the agency level account data um, and then the award level data. Again, the agency level account data, this is data like program activity, a budget term that we use at the federal level. Object class, um, which are categories of spending that we use, again, at the federal level for accounting, categorically the kind of spending that we do. Um, treasury account symbol, um, which is essentially the accounts um, in which the appropriated dollars fall um, when they go to agencies. Um, this agency account level data is not reported um, by grant recipients. Um, in fact, you probably don't even know most of the time um, where your data would fall in the scheme of those categories. Um, and the data standards that we released related to that, that we finalized in May 2015, um, do not affect you. Second, um, the second component of data standards that we tackled were those that related to the awards. Um, these spoke to things like recipient address, place of performance. Um, they included um, work um, to standardize business types um, related to um, the type of recipient that was receiving an award. The question we've gotten is for those data elements, those that we finalized in August of 2015 that are related directly to a federal grant award in this case, um, to what extent does the reporting by a grant recipient change as a result of those final data standards? Um, and to be and perfectly honest, um, we are currently doing that analysis. Um, we know that through a data standards effort um, that standardized the display of the data on USA Spending, which is what these 57 data elements represent, um, is data standards that will ensure a consistent display of data. Um, we cannot, by virtue of deciding on data display standards, um, automatically, without notice and comment, um, attach those requirements to federal grant recipients or any recipients of federal funds. Um, we have requirements at a federal level to ensure there is sufficient notice and comment. Um, and to the extent that either rulemaking is required, um, where changes to existing regulations um, to put into the force and effect these standards are needed, or that changes to existing information collection um, must be pursued, that we need to go through those channels. Um, and so as a result, currently, none of those data standards, um, none of those 57, currently affect recipients of federal funds 
for the subset of those data standards that are related specifically to the award, award-specific characteristics. We're doing an analysis um, in the grants community of 2 CFR, um, which is our uh, portion of the Code of Federal Regulations that speaks to federal grants management policies to determine whether or not at the policy level any standards that we finalize for display purposes this summer affect um, our grants regulations. And if so, then we'll pursue notice and comment um, to, to solicit um, your feedback on those changes. Um, in addition, we're also doing analysis of the existing information collections um, that have been currently approved um, for the grants community and determining to what extent any of those may need to change. Um, we envision at this point, the hypothesis is that there shouldn't be a large change um, because as grant recipients, you're already providing this information in some shape or form. Um, and so we're hopeful that the impact in our goal is to minimize the impact of reporting changes to the grants community, but we're currently undergoing that analysis to ensure that our, our hypothesis is correct. Um, we absolutely invite um, feedback from the community. If, if, you, if you know now that there are specific things, specific forms that need to be changed, I think we'd absolutely want to know. Um, and we can, we'll make sure that we provide, um, after this, um, a, a good channel for you to, to provide that feedback. With respect to the Section 5 pilot, um, the Section 5 pilot is an incredible opportunity um, for us to continue work in the, grants in the grants community writ large to reduce recipient reporting burdens. Um, where the pilot envisions um, us to have an opportunity over a two-year period to identify ways to reduce time and costs associated with reporting um, related to grants, um, as well as contracts, um, we wanted to take a very measured approach um, to how we build that pilot. And Mike, um, well, I'm, I'll be turning to Mike uh, very shortly uh, for him to walk through those specific contours of the pilot as we've um, sort of geared it based on your feedback. Um, but very quickly, in terms of the statutory requirements, the pilot asks us to look at um, opportunities to standard, further standardize reporting across the government, to eliminate unnecessary duplication, and reduce compliance costs. Um, and where OMB, the Office of Management and Budget um, within uh, the Office of the President, has been tasked uh, with that opportunity, um, we have been partnering on the grant side of the House with the Department of Health and Human Services to serve as the executing agent um, for the grant portion um, of the pilot. Um, and to quickly kind of wrap up this overview, I'm going to let Mike get to the real heart of the matter, which is why uh, you're all on the line today. Um, we wanted to make sure that just very briefly we could provide um, an overview of the requirements under the Data Act um, and the general timeline. Um, I think um, this slide is intended to give really a good framing um, to our work um, and give you an opportunity just to see the cadence that we're going to be going through over the next two years. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. That was a great overview. And uh, I just want to say on behalf of HHS that we're very happy to be here today to be able to share information about the pilot models that we have developed. And as Karen stated, this is uh, with a lot of input from the community. It's also with input from previous projects that have been performed, such as the Grant Reporting Information Project, which is done under the Recovery and Accountability Transparency Board. Um, we want to make sure that we're not turning a blind eye to uh, work that's already been done, findings that have already been uh, presented, and make sure that we can further those efforts to ensure that there is some uh, sustainability there. So this first slide is about our approach and the framework. Um, what we are doing is we have said this is an atypical pilot. Uh, as we've moved through this, we've learned it's a lot less atypical and more typical as does happen when you start uh, getting into the weeds of something like this. Uh, we have different areas, as you can see on the bottom right in our circle. We have the single audit, we have the consolidated FFR, we have the Learn Grants or the Grants Information in the Gateway, and we have the Cedar Library. What we're doing is we're putting the data standards around those and we're taking the information, the collection of information from the national dialogue. We are analyzing the information back and forth through these different uh, scenarios or these test models. And we're making sure that we have finalized a test that works um, to 
really meet the, the goal of reducing redundancy, burden, and cost for grant recipients of federal funding. So as you can see, um, we have a lot of information on the slide, but what we have to work towards is having this pilot completed by May of 2017 as we have a report that's due to, through OMB to Congress. And what we want to do in that report is we want to set the roadmap of this is what worked. Hopefully everything works. That's our goal. Um, but we recognize that some of these pilots may not work. They may not meet the goals that we're uh, intending to do. And that's where we want to make sure that we're ready to change course or change direction if the time permits during the pilot period. So I'm going to move on. And uh, I just want to state that I've got Chris Lesnick here with me from HHF. Uh, Chris is leading the Section 5 grants uh, pilot for my office, so I thought it would be good to have him here, and I'm going to ask him to chime in at any time that he feels there's something that I may have skipped over that's very important for you all to hear. Thank you. Moving on to slide 9. So, developing the uh, Section 5 grants pilot. When we started looking at this very closely, we're, we really are following the eGov phases for conducting a pilot, and that is to plan and design, collect and analyze, and report, as you can see in the middle of this screen. As I described in the last slide, uh, it's very important for the folks that are watching what we're doing, and that would be the, the IGs and GAO and every, anybody else who has a, um, a vested interest in this project to know that we are taking a very formal approach to this. And this is just to outline that for everybody so that there isn't any um, question or concern about how we are performing this pilot. And at the very bottom, you can go, and we have a link here to look at the eGov phases for conducting a pilot. Um, if you have any questions in that regard, you're always welcome to reach out to us as the uh, Data Act PMO for the grants pilot, and we can clarify that information for you. So now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of what we are doing. And the first test model that we have is related to the single audit. So I believe since you all are recipients, anybody who's getting over $750,000 in their grants per year is well aware of what the single audit is. It's uh, guided by the OMB A133 audits. And we want to look at this area specifically because from the onset, we've heard that this is a real um, an area where we could improve as a federal government. Um, there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, I've talked to the IG's office and I've talked to grant recipients surrounding the single audit and are we doing the best job that we possibly can there. So when we look at this, we want to make sure that we are comparing these forms um, and the forms that we're looking at are the SFSAC and the CFA forms. We are going to do a survey across the board to make sure that we are approaching the model that we have correctly. And when I say we're going to do a survey, we are currently under um, getting PRA clearance. Um, that should come in early spring, um, late winter, early spring, based on our current uh, plan. But that is not holding up any of the process as far as we are concerned, because we do want to reach out and engage folks throughout this entire process outside of the PRA process. One of the reasons, and we're going to talk about this more at the end for this call, um, we're going to be making sure that we are engaging folks from different ad advocacy groups or the public at large, but not to exceed a number of nine. And we're going to talk to everybody about these test models and make sure that we have them well defined and that they are going to uh, hopefully present the output that we would like from this pilot initiative. So if we move on to slide number 11. You're going to see that the single audit, we have what is our hypothesis here? So, and we have uh, two areas of single audit that we are testing. I just want to say that. The first is with the CIFA and the SFSAC. These are two forms that are, um, that contain similar information in many cases, and the cadence of the form is, is very closely timed to one another. So our plan here is to consolidate the information, run a test, and for anybody who would be involved in that test, we would not be asking that you submit this information twice. This would be one-time submission of information, but we will guide to make sure that on the form that we have created that is a consolidated form, what the required um, elements are from the CIFA and from the SFSAC, 
And then at the end of the day, there may be a couple of more uh, fields that are going to be optional be, to be completed. However, we can take the information, our, our goal is to take the information from this consolidated form and say, hey, you as an entity have complied with your submission. So from that, in that regard, we do not see that there's an increased burden, but until we have this completely and totally defined and we can get this uh, cleared under our PRA process, um, we don't know that we want to make that um, absolute statement at that time, at this time, I should say. Um, that's our goal. We want to make sure that any burden um, is a reduction, even in the testing process. Uh, we don't know if we're always going to meet that goal. I just want to say that right up front. And Mike, just on and on this uh, single audit point, um, the other consideration too here in the combining of the forms is ensuring that the combined form meets the oversight um, yeah. needs of auditors and even those um, for for you all as grant recipients that meets your management needs as well. And so part of the test is. Um, certainly looking at the impact of consolidating the forms and ideal, uh, the hypothesis is that it should reduce burden. Um, but the second is from a programmatic and oversight and auditing perspective, that, that combined form does meet the needs of those communities. Great point, Karen. And thank you for bringing that up because that is, that is critical. Um, we do have to look at these forms, not just from one perspective of the recipient. As I've said um, many times in many engagements, we as the federal government need to change our behaviors in order for us to pass on this uh, streamlined process to a grant recipient. Uh, it's kind of that catch-22 where once you receive federal funds, you're caught up in our bureaucracy. So once we look at our bureaucracy and kind of change that around a little bit and make sure that what we're doing is in the best interest of everybody involved, we're probably not going to have the gains at the end of the day that we're really looking for. If we move on to slide number 12, uh, this is the second portion of the single audit that we are looking to test. And here it is the standard notice of award. We have heard over and over again from multiple grantees that when they go to complete the CIFA and the SFSAC, that not having a standardized notice of award creates headaches um, and creates problems. It makes the process a lot longer than it should be. And we've heard from um, vendors who provide services to these grantees that, hey, if you guys standardize this in a way, we can automate a lot of this stuff on behalf of the recipients for you. Um, we just have a problem with the way that it's being done right now because within an agency you can have various different NOAs, notice of award. Uh, within that agency you can have different operating divisions that have different notices of award and then you can have different offices within that agency that once again have different notices of award. So we're looking across the board to gain insight into all these standardized elements on notice of award. We are going to present a standardized Notice of award. It may not be the one that's used at the end of the day. It's just to uh, uh, perform the test and make sure that we can get the feedback that yes, this indeed does help. And then that's our action item to take forward in our report to the Hill to say this is something we need. We believe needs to be done across the federal government. And at that point, we can start to determine exactly how we're going to do that. Chris, did you anything? Okay. Okay, so next uh, I'm going to talk on um, slide number 13 about the consolidated FFR. Um, anybody who knows about the federal financial report, um, you all know better than anybody. Uh, I will state that my previous lifetime I was uh, running the payment management system, so this is where I got my introduction to the uh, issues and concerns cons uh, surrounding the FFR. Um, many agencies right now, uh, you have your systems such as PMS where they're collecting lines 1 through 10C and that's being collected in the system and it's driving the expenditures and all that great stuff for the accounting purposes. But then after line 10C, that information is being submitted directly to the OPTIV or the agency who, is, uh, who has awarded the grant. Very segregate, segregated processes and not always aligning, um, many times causing the issues with closed out at the end of the day, which is uh, you know, an issue that the federal government faces and obviously the grantees face as well. We are um, working with the payment management system, and in this particular case, we had to have an agency that would step up to the plate and say, yes, we want to do this. Um, you know, we are limited on what we can do, but the payment management system said, yes, we'll make changes in our system so that we can collect all that information through one portal. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slide over to the next slide because I'm really talking about the details here, um, slide 14. We are going to take that information in one portal and see if we get it and we share that information out from that one collection point, 
seeing the entire FFR collected electronically at one place and one time, is that going to help? Is that going to benefit um, the grantees? Well, the GRIP tells us that it should do that. Is it going to help with sharing the information throughout the federal government? Absolutely, as long as we have a standard platform, or I should say interface and way to exchange that information or that data. So we're really looking forward to this because this is building on what the, uh, uh, was done um, under the Recovery and Accountability Transparency Board, the GRIP report, and we want to prove this one out. Um, this one is a little different from the rest because we are working with a specific opt-in to do this. Um, only grantees that are within are receiving funding from that opt-in are going to be uh, considered within this pilot. However, um, the Agency for Children and Families does have a very diverse portfolio of grants, so we are confident that whatever we do here is representative of the federal government at large and the grant recipient community at large. So the next thing that we have for you all to uh, have fun with is Learn Grants. Uh, we also have been calling it the Grants Information Gateway. This is on slide 15. This is something that we stood up at HHS under the pilot and uh, it's sitting on grants.gov. It really, uh, if you've ever read any of the books, uh, you can go to divorce for dummies or anything like that. But this is a fun one because for the first time uh, that I'm aware of and the folks in my PMO and most everybody else we've talked to, it's the first time you can go to one place and you can find all the information about the grants life cycle. If you're working with grants, it's great. Um, you know grants, you know how to apply, you know how to go through the entire process. If you're brand new, it can be a very difficult, cumbersome, and scary uh, process from what we've heard from people because they end up doing a lot of duplicative work. This is one place where folks can go, they can find that information, and we've already, we are already getting feedback from the, the uh, grant recipient community that this is very helpful. We're going to continue to measure this to obtain metrics on it. Uh, I'm just sliding over to slide number 16 so everyone can read what the hypothesis and the test model are. Um, but what we want to do is as we move along, we are still looking for your input to figure out how can we make this better? How can we tie this to other areas um, that would help you as a grant recipient community to use this more in a more robust manner? Um, the, the statistics say it's being used, it's being used a lot, and, it, and everybody likes it. But again, this pilot isn't just about that. It's how do we make this entire process better? And we are hoping that we can get some great recommendations and things that we may not have ever thought of and move forward on those as a result. When you get to slide number 17, we have created the Common Data Elements Repository Library. We affectionately call it CEDAR. And, um, this is a neat little tool. Right now, what we have done is we have taken the grant-specific uh, data standards that have been determined, and they are sitting on a public-facing side where anybody can go out and they can look at the theater library and they can get the term, the definition, and the authoritative source for that term. Um, now, that's not the end of the Cedar library, so I'm going to just roll on to the Cedar library test number, test number one. And what this is, is we want to take, since terminology is changing and uh, the Data Act has been a big driver of this and also the Uniform Grants Guidance, we are going to update the CEDAR library. We are going to take the new terms, in many cases terminology where the definition has changed from what somebody thought it was previously, and we want to test that and say if someone has access to the CEDAR library, does it help them to complete forms quicker, more accurately, and ultimately better? Um, than if they don't have access to the library, meaning you're going to have to go look up that information on your own. And as we've all done a Wikipedia search, it's not always correct, the information that you're going to get back. So this is going to tell you what an authoritative source versus going out and guessing what that authoritative source is and knowing that you could complete the, um, the form or the application uh, with certainty as to how you are completing it. We think that that will be a big benefit, and we're, we're really looking forward to how that can be used, not just for this test, but we, we have hopes that it can be used in many other ways. Which leads me to the CEDAR-2 test. And what we found out very quickly on the federal side of this, um, not the outward facing, is that it, the tool 
because we are putting the standards from different business lines across the federal government, we are identifying differences not just in the 57 elements that we are working on at the Data Act, but we are, we are uh, determining a lot of differences beyond just those 57 elements. So since the goal here of the Data Act is to standardize stuff, to be talking the same language across the board, across uh, federal government to grantee and across the business lines within the federal government, here is a place where we can take a tool, we can look at what is on a particular form, we can say, hey, does that exist on multiple forms? And if so, is there a better way to collect this information moving forward? Uh, ultimately, when I think about this, I say, if we have 150 forms today, could we use this tool to get down to 75 tomorrow? Um, that's what we're hoping that we're going to find out of this test. And the goal here is ultimately, if you have 50% less forms to deal with, the process should be 50% easier. Now, I realize that's not always going to be the straight math that I'm, I'm saying, but that obviously is what we want to prove out within the test. Um, we're excited about this. We think that the library can use it, be used in other ways, but here's how we're presenting it for the test model. Um, Chris, I don't know. Did you want to talk to the timeline, or do you want me to talk to that? I'm fine with talking to the timeline. Thank you, Mike. Um, as you can see now on this slide here, we've got a timeline that goes in monthly increments and some seasonal type stuff, um, more or less. As you can see here, we um, concurred with the test models with uh, our OMB colleagues in September of this year. Uh, we have a Federal Register notice that was published on November 2nd. If you haven't seen it, please go out to the Federal Register and find that. Uh, there's a lot of good information in there about what we're doing and conducting on these tests. So again, I want to point people toward that. Um, at the end of November, uh, and within the next few weeks, we're going to be holding, starting a series of outreach efforts, this webinar being one of them. You could say the first of an outreach effort uh, that will continue forward over the course of the next few months to get out to the recipient community to let them know that the pilot modules have been decided and we're actually going to start looking to recruit people to take place uh, in the test models as testers. So, um, you know, we want to get that message out to as many people as we can. We want a very diverse population. Somewhere in the, the December time frame, you know, early December time frame, we'll be looking at, you know, as Mike said earlier, a smaller group of people that will work with us to go through the test models just to make sure our designs are on track, they're effective, they're workable, and, you know, we'll be collecting that feedback and using that to revise those test models. Um, the big dates coming up is somewhere in the spring time frame is when we'll actually start working on the actual conducting the test models, because we have to collect data for a one-year period of time to get 2017 date. And then finally in August, we have the, the report to Commerce. One other thing I want to reiterate, though, is in the slides here, we don't exactly bring that out, but the pilot effort has actually started. It's been ongoing since May of 2015. Uh, when we released the National Dialogue, when the Learn Grants portal went up, and when the Cedar Library went up. Those tools are out there now. We invite you to go out and take a look at them. The other thing is with the National Dialogue, if you don't want to be a formal test participant, you know, pilot participant, you don't have to be. Um, but you could go out to that portal, and you could voice opinions, and you could give feedback on the various filtering questions out there. We want to encourage people to do that. Uh, we realize that not everybody has the desire or maybe the time to get involved more extensively, but that's something you can do at your will. So again, please uh, look for the dialogue tool and then go out to the Learn Grants site and go out to the Cedar Library. We're also requesting feedback on those tools as well. So you don't have to be necessarily a tester, but you can be someone who gets involved with the pilot efforts as they're going on now. Okay, thank you, Chris, um, and I appreciate you uh, talking about the National Dialogue because that was something I totally skipped over and a great tool that we have available for obtaining feedback whether you want to be an official participant in the pilot or not. Um, so again, please use that. We're moving on to slide 
number without my glasses can't see 21. And what we're getting to here is our next steps. And I don't know, Karen, did you want to talk to the next steps, or we can kind of go back and forth? Yeah, um, you know, I think I think back and forth sounds good, Mike. I mean, one of the things that we have heard loud and clear from all of you in our grant recipient community um, is you're really excited. We're all excited about the Section 5 pilot because it really is this great opportunity to coalesce great ideas we've had literally over the past decade be perfectly honest, um, from all of you, of how, if not longer, of how to improve our grants management from a reporting perspective. Um, and so the question has been, how do I get, how do I participate? How do I engage? What are the next steps? Um, and so, you know, I think this slide is really intended to talk through kind of the, the multiple ways in which we want to pull folks together. I mean, um, the associations, um, you know, including NASAC, AG, others. Um, that have been so engaged. I think we want to continue to have the dialogue at those um, in those fora um, to make sure that the areas that we have identified um, they hit the right they, they hit the right um, note um, that there aren't additional other pain points that we really should be focusing on. Um, but then in addition, um, in addition to those forms, I think you know one of the questions is, hey, if I'm not part of the various communities um, within more of the associations, are there other opportunities for me to voice um, to HHS um, that I'm interested in participating? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I'll just uh, caveat that and yeah. say that we have uh, done some general outreach and the feedback that we've gotten from folks so far is, the, the question has been, do you want to be a participant in the pilot? And it just there are no commitment required in anything. We're just curious if we can get a list that we can say, here are the folks who are interested. Um, the first thing that happens when that uh, question goes out is a lot of questions come back. How much of my time is going to be required? When are you starting? How long is this going to go? Uh, it creates a lot of questions that, quite honestly, we are not ready to answer at this time. Um, but having said that, we want to make sure that we can engage everybody who wants to be involved in this pilot, not just the folks from um, the uh, advocacy groups, and we really, really appreciate that, but we realize that there are folks that are the independent mom and pop shops and things like that. Um, getting to those folks is not always as simple, but we don't want to uh, neglect them either as we go through this process. So I guess I have the question to the group of, we have gone out and we've asked for feedback as to who would want to be involved, and quite honestly, we have a list of one right now who says, yes, we want to be involved, and no question that. Um, if we're going out with a list, or, or if we're going out and we're requesting this information, and we're simply asking if you're interested in participating in the pilot or not, with no commitment, that you have to actually participate when you find out all the details behind the pilot, is that something that the group would want to have happening right now? Um, we recognize that there's a, a lot going on, that we haven't outlined everything to the nth detail or nth degree, but if we could have that list, that would help us out a lot to do a lot of um, stratifying what numbers we're looking at so that we can basically report out and say, we think we have a good idea of the population of this pilot. Uh, if I could just, may I, the other thing I, the point we want to emphasize is that for any of the test models that you choose, that you may choose you want to participate in, we want to make sure you understand is we're going to ask you to do some things that are a little different, but they're not anything that wouldn't be under your normal course of business anyway. People are going to go look for information on how to apply for a grant or find a funding opportunity, you know, going to learn grants. You're going to have to fill out application forms to do things, you know, and you're going to have to find definitions for terms of you know, in terms of art for something. So you're going to go out to, you know, in this case, we might ask you to go to the Cedar Library. You're going to do reporting anyway against your grants opportunities, getting into the FFR and the single audit materials. So we're not asking people to do things that are out of their normal course of business. What we are going to have to look at is using some different tools that you may not have used before and maybe to do some submissions in a slightly different way than you've done them in the past but it's nothing extraordinary or outside of your normal swim lane, so to speak. So we do want to reiterate that. And we're also very sensitive to people's time and the, and the commitment for this. And, um, you know, we do keep that in mind when designing the test modules and, and, and as we go out throughout the course of the testing. So. And so as, as um, both, 
both HHS and OMB have been thinking about this pilot for quite some time. I think we have wanted to make sure that we um, are sensitive to what the recipients, um, what all of you have said, um, that while you're really interested in signing up, you do want more details before you sign up to participate in the pilot. The question, Mike, that you're posing to the group is whether or not um, uh, grant recipients would like an opportunity to at least signal um, to you all at HHS, Mike, that they're at least potentially interested. Um, and I think, Kinney, it would be great to, um, I don't know if there's a polling function or something on, um, on, on this webinar um, in terms of technology, but it would be great to get a sense of the group somehow of whether or not that would be something that uh, grant recipients would be interested in, some way to signal to HHS that at least now um, they may be interested. Right. Interested with understanding there's no interim commitment, just that there is an interest. Yeah, Karen, I think uh, maybe in the interest of time, we could maybe do that after the webinar. We've got, obviously, the contact information for everybody today. Maybe we could poll them uh, after the today's event and, and see what feedback we get. That sounds like a great idea, Kenny. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, this slide, when we move over to 22, uh, it just follows on to what we were just saying. I think we kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, never never a bad thing to say something twice. Uh, we have the links to the different areas if you want to go to the National Dialogue or to Learn Grants or um, generally more information about the Data Act. Uh, all those links are at the bottom of slide 22. Um, we've already told you that we're trying to reach out through the advocacy groups, but uh, as we just mentioned, we're, we're not limiting our, our reach in that one avenue. So hopefully we can get a, a really good list of who's interested in participating and you know, I mean, if a thousand people say they want to participate, and at the end of the day, only 300 do, I, 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 that's great. I, I, I won't turn away 300 people. So, um, you know, we're, we're excited to move this forward. Um, hopefully, we have been able to provide you some or a lot more detail that I believe everybody has been wanting for a long time. Uh, we apologize, but these things do take time to put together and get through all the clearances. Um, but now we're at the point where we're getting ready to move forward. And we're, we're really happy to share this with you. We just, uh, we're looking forward to, you know, what your feedback is in regards to it. And so in terms of next steps, as part of, um, as part of this discussion, I think the thing that we really wanted to have you take away from this conversation is not only the areas of focus of the Section 5 pilot, and thank you so much to Mike and Chris and um, the team at HHS who's really taken up this work on Section 5 um, with such thought leadership. Um, thank you for that. Um, one of the things that we wanted to leave um, you all with on the webinar is just some actionable next steps. Um, so first and foremost, um, um, thank you in advance, Kenny, for, for your help in identifying um, from folks whether or not they'd like an opportunity to express to HHS that they're interested potentially in the pilot. Um, I think second, Chris had mentioned earlier in the webinar the Federal Register Notice um, related to the Paper Production Act. Um, clearance and what we could do, um, Kenny, is we could send you a link to that FRN, that Federal Register Notice, if folks can have it and take a look and comment on that as well. Um, I think third is based on today's webinar, where we hopefully have laid out for you in a more concise way um, the additional testable areas that we're going to be pursuing, in addition to what we launched in May. Um, would like continued feedback um, because where these are the the areas that we've landed on based on the national dialogue and all of your feedback, even through um, uh, beginning with the uniform guidance process and even uh, prior to that, um, we know that this is, this is not the full suite of areas where there are opportunities to reduce burden. So we always welcome additional areas as well. Um, and with respect to this particular pilot, uh, this slide that laid out the milestones, we are marching towards um, finalizing, you know, we finalized these areas want to then identify and select the participants um, and then launch the, uh, these remaining testing areas um, in the spring um, so we can start moving um, and collecting data there. Um, so with that, um, Kenny, um, it would be great to open it up for questions um, from the broader group um, to make sure that we are answering all the areas that there may be additional um, confusion or need for clarification on. All right, Karen, thank you very much. And Mike and Chris, also thank you so much for that informative presentation. We covered, you guys covered a lot of ground today. Uh, and we do have some questions in the queue, but just as a reminder, if you do have a question, you want to just type that in and send it to us. 
uh, just use your questions tab located in your webinar toolbar. should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Just type that in and hit send. Uh, we, we do have about uh, maybe five minutes here, uh, five to ten minutes for questions. Uh, Karen, I just want to start, uh, I think you covered it pretty well, but just I think a lot of the confusion has been around this notion that under the Data Act, the reporting, the reporting really re applies right now to the federal agencies. But yet, recipients are going to be uh, held accountable and in compliance and have to follow these data, uh, data elements. There seems to be a gap there. You know, uh, are we, are as, a, as a recipient, are we, do we have responsibility or do we not? Can you kind of yes. just reconcile that gap and clarify one more time for everybody out there what exactly the recipients have responsibility for under the Data Act? Absolutely. Um, thanks so much for that question because there is a lot of confusion and we know that there have been a lot of different um, conferences and dialogues about the Data Act which I think unfortunately are uh, mudding some of the waters um, of what is required and what isn't. Um, so again, where the Data Act calls for establishment of data standards, there are really two types of data standards. Uh, the first is those agency account level kind of financial data. Um, things like treasury count symbol and program activity and object class, um, things that really have really not much to do with a federal recipient, if anything at all. None of those apply um, to federal recipients um, for grants. Now, with respect to those data standards um, that we have taken an opportunity to further standardize and clarify that relate to federal awards, um, these are data elements. Um, to be perfectly frank, these are the same data elements that you all have seen on USA Spending um, since 2008. Um, these have not changed at all um, with respect to the actual data elements. Um, you have provided this data in the normal course of your business in conjunction with your grant, and the federal agency has taken that data and put it onto USA Spending on your behalf um, as you, where you are a prime recipient. Um, and for subrecipients, that information is uh, reported on behalf of on behalf of you um, by your prime recipient, the awarding um, entity. None of these currently, none of those data elements, um, those 42 data elements that relate to awards, um, have changed in reporting requirements to federal recipients. And the reason why, um, and I, I highlighted this a little earlier, is that we cannot, as a federal government, have new requirements for reporting of data unless we go through the proper notice and comment period. So at this point, we have not gone out for notice and comment either through changes in regulations or in changes to specific information collections. Um, we are doing that assessment right now. Um, the, the sense of the grants community um, is that that information that is currently reported on USA spending connected to the award is information that federal agencies receive in the routine course of business. Um, the recipient's name, the location of the recipient, the purpose of the award, the place of the award, the dollar amount connected to that prime award, the type of organization that recipient is, all of that information is currently collected um, by the recipient. Now, in order to get any of that, that data um, to conform to any of the new standards that have been published, um, we would envision that, frankly, the agencies can make, um, make and ensure um, that the data standards are complied with for display purposes. That there may not need to be additional questions back to the recipient. Um, so as an example, if we currently collect information related to place of performance, um, and place of performance is defined differently on USA spending, um, we can translate that data to ensure that on a, from a display perspective, the data related to place of performance is what the desk defines term on USA spending is supposed to be. Um, from a federal perspective, we can do that. Um, I think the question is whether or not there are any pieces of data we don't currently collect um, using the existing mechanisms um, for purposes of USA spending reporting. Um, and so to the, in the event that there are any changes that need to be made that would flow through recipients, um, we would go through the proper notes and comment rulemaking and or paperwork reduction act process. Um, to ensure that we are not arbitrarily um, adding burden um, for reporting purposes onto all of you as our non-federal uh, partners. 
All right, very good, Karen. Thank you so much for that. I, I just think that helps clarify, you know, a lot of the confusion that's been out there, just in some cases hard to reconcile those two elements, uh, you know, where you have the reporting by the federal agencies, but yet following the data elements by federal agencies and recipients. So thank you for that clarification. Uh, Mike and Chris, I'm going to ask you the kind of the same type of question, eliminate some of this confusion if we can. I think a lot of folks out there have felt like if they participate in the pilot, they're going to be reporting back into USAspending.gov on, on grant expenditures uh, using the new data elements and those kinds of things. It, it doesn't sound like that's necessarily the case with the pilot. Uh, no, I'll speak up for the two of us. That's not the case. We have specific models that we're testing. Um, when it comes to expenditure data, that's going to have to come from a federal financial system. Um, that's a requirement of USA spending. So that information is going to be driven on the federal side of the house. Um, we are collecting information in the pilot to see where we can reduce the redundancy or improve redundancy uh, burden and cost in those six specific areas that were outlined. So outside of the consolidated FFR, which is just reporting, uh, folks are already reporting their expenditure data through the payment management system for lives 1 through 10C. It's collecting the performance data, which is the, less, the rest of that form, through that one portal. Does that help? It does. And, and you just kind of answered an, another question I had, Mike. I think one of your slides, you know, talking about the consolidated FFR, you mentioned one system. I just want to make sure that one system is the payment management system. Is that correct? For the purposes of the, the uh, pilot, yes. Now, we are just going to prove that this is going to be the best way to do it. We are not saying that at the end of the day that the payment management system is going to be the only payment system out there. It may be determined that it's another payment system. We can't uh, we're, we're going to make the recommendation, if this is a successful pilot, that that be the case, that there be one payment system out there that send and collect. Or, conversely, is there another way to collect that information in another system wholeheartedly? I mean, we don't know the end game there. We're just trying to prove that if we get the information through one system, that that information, that collection of that information is easier for the grantee and that it can then be disseminated in electronic format, reducing the idea that anybody's going to have to submit forms once, twice, three times in different formats to different places. And yeah, the payment, sounds good. The payment system um, work is really important because there are multiple payment systems that exist right now across the government. Um, and so in addition to testing the viability of burden reduction, it's also whether or not the technology um, can do that um, and be able to support um, potential multiple programs leveraging that one payment system. Um, I did want to just go back to, Kenny, um, your point about the Section 5 pilot and reporting the expenditure data to USA Spending, um, and just make sure that there isn't any confusion out there. USA Spending um, currently does not report on expenditures related to the awards, um, and, uh, and in 2017, in May, concurrent with uh, Data Act uh, implementation, we are not anticipating an expansion of award-level reporting to include um, expenditures either. Um, I think one of the, there are opportunities, there are lots of opportunities beyond our Data Act work to continue to improve federal spending transparency. Expenditures is one, there are lots of others that we're, we'd love to get in with all of you and talk about. Um, but as we talk about our Data Act requirements um, and the statute requirements by May, um, that is not um, an area of expansion kind of, uh, that is, that we are marching towards for May 2017. All right, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we do have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Let me just, uh, first of all, Mike, since we were on the pilots, one of the questions is, it, again, I, got, I know this is kind of speculative, but is it likely that you will add any pilots based on what you learned from the first initial pilot? Um, if we learned something very early on, uh, we would consider it because there would be the uh, ability to collect information for one, the one-year period. Um, that's what we you have to be cognizant of. The statute says it has to be a collection over a one-year period. Um, right. So it has to come pretty quick and it would have to be uh, pretty well thought out because I, I can just say that getting the details has, has been real hard work here. Coming up with the general idea, that hasn't been too hard. But then when you get down to how am I going to set this up and how am I going to test this and be able to uh, provide something that is qualitative and quantitative at the end, um, 
that's certainly been a, a, a lot harder. And I will say um, to that point that the Data Act creates this um, two-year timeline um, that is contemplated under the statute for the purposes of the statute. Um, but lifting up one from an OMB and broader you know, grants community perspective, this two-year pilot is not the only time. And frankly, um, it is just part of a series of work that we've done um, since the early 2000s and even preceding that and work we're going to continue to do even after May 2017. So even if um, we receive really excellent ideas that don't fit under the, the constraints of our next year in our work because we already have six very full areas that we want to test, um, I absolutely would anticipate um, that there are clear opportunities beyond May 2017 to pursue additional work um, to identify how we can reduce recipient reporting burden. It does not end um, with this pilot. Um, so with that, I would say uh, the more ideas, the better. I think it is not a matter of whether or not ideas hit, meet the cutoff, um, but just how we can prioritize those ideas um, starting today and moving through the next two, five, ten years. Very good. I, I, let's squeeze in one more question. I know we're almost out of time here, but I suspect we do have some auditors on the line. And this question from the audience, uh, how will the Data Act affect the auditor's work? Uh, will auditors have to provide an opinion on the accuracy or the completeness of the Data Act reporting by recipients? And I, I suspect the answer, uh, obviously the Act outlines really specific uh, tests and responsibilities for the federal IGs, but it's, it's not as clear for the recipient auditors. Can either of you address that question? Absolutely. So this is a question that has come up in the context of the foundational statute, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, and for those auditors who are listening today, um, you know and are aware that the Single Audit Compliance Supplement does speak to reporting requirements um, concurrent with um, FAFATA. Um, and specifically, those reporting requirements are with respect to sub-recipient reporting. Um, those are currently areas that are audited. Um, for completeness and accuracy. It will continue to be um, areas that will be audited for completeness and accuracy. Um, just to put a pin on an area of work that we need to continue doing, um, we do know that improvements can be made to the sub-award reporting system, which has created for some recipients um, burden and challenges um, to attest to the fact that their data is accurate and complete. Um, so we know there's more work there. Um, but to the point in the question of what are the auditing standards um, related to Data Act and have they changed for recipients, um, the answer is no. Um, the fundamental reporting requirements by recipients um, remains unchanged. Um, it is still the same reporting requirements uh, for several of the reporting under FAFADA. All right. Thanks, Karen. And uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. And, and by the way, Mike, I, uh, one of the audience participants has given his email address, and he's very interested in participating uh, in the pilot. So we'll, we'll share that with you, and, and thank you to that person for uh, volunteering. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. That concludes our webinar today on the Data Act, what recipients need to know. I'd like to thank Karen and Mike and Chris, again, for sharing their knowledge and experience with us today. And also like to extend a special thanks uh, to Helena Sims of AGA for all of her work in planning and arranging today's webinar, and, and many thanks to Anna Penniston of our staff who helped handle the logistics of today's event. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, AGA and NASAC and a whole host of uh, other associations that represent federal award recipients have been meeting periodically with OMB and U.S. Treasury and, and HHS and GAO, for that matter, to get the la latest regarding implementation of the Data Act. It's our intent and our hope to conduct more webinars in the future to keep everyone informed of developments that affect this important legislation. And we'll certainly keep you apprised on details of future webinars as they evolve. One last thing, just housekeeping. Today we are using an electronic evaluation form in an effort to gather your feedback about today's event. We're particularly interested in your thoughts and suggestions on the Data Act topics that you'd like to hear more about in future trainings. Uh, for groups, uh, please make sure that the key contact in the group provides the link to everyone to the evaluation form. And those participating as individuals, you should have received the link to the evaluation form directly via email earlier today. Please take a few minutes and fill those out for us. We really would appreciate your uh, feedback and input. 
hope everybody enjoyed today's webinar. Karen and Mike and Chris, again, thank you so much for speaking, sharing a lot of information today. Hope everybody enjoyed it. Have a great afternoon.